John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. Those of you who've been walking with the Lord for a relatively short time have no doubt had this experience. You're talking with some friends, some buddies, some of the gals you hang around with, and you make mention that you're, you're headed back to church for Wednesday night. Or, or maybe you're getting together with some believers during the week for a home fellowship, and they look at you dumbfounded, and they're like, what? Church in the middle of the week? I mean, didn't you already go on Sunday? They can't even begin to imagine what would motivate you to come to church twice in a week. And some of you are so hungry for the word and so just in love with the Lord that if there was something you could come to, you'd come every single day of the week. You see, that's foreign to the unbeliever's mindset because for people outside of the church, I don't mean outside of this building, I'm talking about outside of the understanding that what God's about is a personal relationship with us, outside of that circle of understanding, it's genuinely considered that what we're about is rules and regulations. We get together to study the Ten Commandments and see how many we broke, and then we say a little prayer, and, and then we, you know, you know, why would you have to do that more than once a week? But, but here's the whole point. As we've been studying together so far in John's Gospel, we've seen the entire focus is on relationship. It's not about rules and regulations. Oh, yeah, there are rules. Yeah, there are regulations. Yes, there are laws. All of them for our benefit and our blessing. But the bottom line is God's about relationship. And there are three must in John chapter 3. The first was the must of the sinner. We considered it together last time. You must be born again. And this talks to us, speaks to us about the most wonderful possible earthly experience. If you've ever been at the birth of a baby, man, there is nothing like it. And I encourage you, dads, if you, you know, get an opportunity, uh, this is a generation where we're welcomed in the, in the, um, you know, birthing room as, as long as we don't pass out or anything, you know, weird like that. But when my dad, you know, found out my mom was pregnant and ready to give birth, I mean, that, of course, those took some time in between. But when, when it was time, I mean, he went to the local bar and waited for the call. That was common in his day. But, but I'll tell you, I've been at a couple births, both of my sons, and it is the most amazing, wonderful, incredible experience in life. And so he picks that experience as he says, this is really what I'm looking for. I want you to experience something so out of the ordinary, so extraordinary, that I can only call it a new birth. I want you to enter into a relationship where, where you know me and grow in me. And, and that's exactly what happens when you have a little baby. They come out of that womb, they know nothing, they've had no experiences, but then a lifetime of loving on them and blessing them and providing for them and protecting them and teaching them and nurturing them. That's the nature of our relationship with God. So when you're born again, and he says you must be, then you can call God the man upstairs, you know, the guy that people have an understanding with, you can actually call him Father, our Father who art in heaven. Abba, Father, the word literally means Daddy, Abba. And so he says, the must of the sinner, you must be born again. Then there's the must of the Savior. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The must of the sinner is you must be born again. The must of the Savior, lift it up. It's a picture for us of the cross. Why? Because were it not for the cross, we never could be born again. We never could enter in. There'd be no redemption or forgiveness of our sin. We wouldn't be able to call God, Father, Daddy. And so... You must be born again, and he must be lifted up, crucified, in order for that to happen. There's yet one more must in John 3, and that is, he must increase, and I must decrease. Now, we're going to talk about that one in the context of the passage we're considering, but, but here's 
where I wanted to, to go with all of this. If perhaps you're one yourself that, that thinks this whole thing is about rules and regulations and laws and thou shalt not, you need to know it's far more than that, far more wonderful than that. And he takes us now from this image and this picture of being born again and entering into a, a father-son or father-daughter relationship and he takes us to the next most precious relationship in all of our earthly experience, that of the bride and the bridegroom. Let me tell you what we've learned so far about Jesus. These are declarations in the first three chapters regarding who Jesus is, what he's all about. In chapter one, we were told he is the word and we're told he's God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. We're told that Jesus is the light of the world. We're told that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father. We learn that, that He is the Christ and that He is the Lord. That He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's called Jesus in these first three chapters. His name literally means Yahweh is salvation. He's called rabbi or teacher. He's called Messiah, which means savior. He's called the king of Israel, the son of man, a miracle worker. He who came down from heaven and now added to all of that, we have yet one more title and one more picture, and that is that of the bridegroom. Well, let's jump into the passage because I can't wait to get to that part and share some insights, some things that I've observed as I've stood at the altar with couple after couple after couple, year after year. And uh, here's where it all starts for us. Verse 22, we find after these things, a f favorite phrase of the Apostle John who wrote this gospel, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anan near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Two quick things. John began his ministry of baptism out in the wilderness in the dead, dry desert. But God led him to these pools of water. And the names there in chapter uh, 3, verse 23, are, are important to us. Actually, it's verse 22. It tells us that he was baptizing. I was right the first time. Little spaced in the grace. That happens. Uh, he was in Anon. The word means springs near Salem. And that word, of course, means peace. So, so the picture that develops just to, and knowing what the words mean is that God led him to the place, the springs of peace, a place of refreshment, a place of renewal. And what was happening at that place? He was calling people to repentance. Repent, he said. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another thing worth noting though these are sort of just introductory and not nearly the heart of where we're going is that in spite of the fact that Jesus was now on the scene and his disciples were baptizing, as we'll see in the next chapter, not Jesus personally, but his disciples baptizing in his name and in his place. So by his authority, it said Jesus was baptizing. John continued his ministry up until the point when he is arrested and imprisoned. His ministry of baptism, that is. And this is important because I think some of us, and it may be that some of you who are getting up in years and you've been a Christian for a long time, you're kind of feeling a little worn out and you're thinking, you know, I've ministered and I've spent myself and I've given myself to the Lord and, and his work and now I'm just going to kind of wait until he comes. Listen, you want to keep on serving and ministering until you see him face to face. The very purpose of our existence, to know him and to share him, to love him and to represent him. Uh, we want to continue on with that throughout our entire lives. And, and we find John doing that. Though Jesus was there, though he'd said, behold, the Lamb of God. John continued to faithfully occupy in that ministry that he'd been given. Well, 
In verse 25, a controversy, a debate, a dispute arises, and it arises around this idea of purification. There arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Now, this no doubt was related to the fact that John was baptizing, and he was baptizing Jews. You need to know that when they thought of purification judicially, they, as we do, thought of the blood. Though this is prior to the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus, prior to his crucifixion, under the Levitical system, the Mosaic law, there were sacrifices morning and evening every single day. There were special holy days where there were multiple sacrifices. There was the Day of Atonement where there were special sacrifices. So when they thought of being cleansed judicially, being purified judicially, they knew it took blood. There had to be sacrifice. When it came to being cleansed practically, evil thoughts, evil words, bad attitudes, bad activities. They understood that the word had a place in that and the word actually had potential for that. How did they know? Psalm 119 verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to your word. Jesus builds on that idea when he says, now you are clean through the word I've spoken unto you. So cleansed judicially by the blood, cleansed practically by the word. Now John the Baptist is in the wilderness saying that won't cut it. That's not enough. Though both were ordained by and provided by God, John came saying you need to repent as well. It's not just making a sacrifice. It's not just acknowledging or even obeying the laws of God, but it's repenting of sin and turning trusting in, relying upon Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so the dispute comes. What's this purification from baptism? What's the point of the baptism? Later we'll read, we're buried with him in baptism, raised in newness of life. It's a symbolic picture of entering into Jesus, dying to self, and being raised to live for him. Well, Beyond that, there was a report, verse 26. They came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing, and all are coming to him. John's disciples experienced something that most of us at one point or another do experience. They were expressing concern and a bit of confusion because the crowds that had gathered around John who were fascinated by him and listening to him were now turning to and following after Jesus. Now this doesn't trouble John at all and he's going to give us some incredible word pictures and, and going to show us four things that, that he certainly was and some things he wasn't and, and then point to four in Jesus' life. But before we get there, just understand his response to all of this is based on a very powerful and important understanding that we're not in any kind of competition with one another, with other believers, with other churches. I, I do know that that's inherent. It, it sort of just comes as we become Christians and we bring a lot of baggage from our old way of seeing people in the world. We do tend to compete. But, but you need to know that the Apostle Paul writes and he says, listen, if you're the kind of person that says, well, we're of Calvary or well, we're Baptist or we're Presbyterian or they were in that day saying, we're of Paul, we're of Apollos, uh, we're of Cephas, well, I'm a Calvinist, well, I'm Arminian. If you're all about that, his sa he says, his word is, he says, you're carnal. Now, that word can mean immoral and perverse and all that, but it doesn't have to. I'll tell you what it mostly means. It means you're just a big baby. You haven't grown up, and you're thinking like a child. How, when does it start? My dad's tougher than your dad. I, at three years old, you hear kids saying, my mom's cookies are better than your cookies. Our school's better than your school. Our team could beat your team any day. And see, that's carnality. Yeah, we think like that as children. But when we grow, when we mature, we're supposed to see past that. We're supposed to be concerned for other people, not competing with other people. 
And it has no place in Jesus' church. And John knows it. And I don't want you to see how clearly he, he makes that known. He says, in response, we, we have their report. Here's John's response. Verse 27, a man can receive nothing. And I have this underlined. I'd encourage you to do the same if you don't have a problem marking your Bible. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bore me witness and bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but have sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled He must increase, but I must decrease. He says a man can receive nothing unless it's given him from heaven. And listen, I love that. Understanding what that means, knowing that every single born-again believer in this room right now or listening to this on the Internet or who will hear it later in some other form, know this. Every single believer in Jesus, born again of his spirit, is called a full-time ministry. And 1 Corinthians 12 says every single one of us have special ministry gifts, supernatural giftings from the Lord, and supernatural empowerment. So that the ministry that he's purposed for you, the spiritual gifts he's given you, They perfectly complement one another. And the power to glorify him and bless others, man, it is readily and and always accessible and available. So what that means is we can't possibly be in competition. There's no way we could look at one another and, and, and that you or I could be used by God and then feel a little proud and think, well, sometimes we do, but that's because we're carnal. Because we're like children, we're like, look at me, look at me. You know, remember when you first got your, your, your first toys at Christmas and you were, you, you, know, you were old enough to recognize? I mean, you first have kids, they get toys. They're just like blobs laying there, you know. You're opening, oh, look at look at you know, and they're like, uh. But as you grow, as they grew and grow, then you recognize, oh, a new bike and all that. And, and kids go around bragging about what they got. And again, we bring this into the church. So it's like, well, I'm a teacher. Oh, I'm an evangelist. Hey, I have a gift. I, I don't know what it is, but Sam said I have a gift. And uh, here's my point. If you get caught up in that kind of thinking, you're going to be comparing yourself with one another, and you're going to ultimately grow prideful as you see people that seem to be accomplishing less in God's kingdom, seem to be less dynamic or whatever it might be. You'll be prideful. And listen, in that area, the Lord says, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you're some big thing? He causes us to stop and consider, okay, if it's his ministry and he gives it to me as a gift and it's his gifts and he he empowers me and, and does all that, well, people should be blessed by what I do and God should be glorified, but I should never be lifted up in the process, nor should you be. We should simply be grateful that God even wants to use our lives. I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed. And while many of you have only known me as a pastor, and so you think, well, yeah, God gifted you or uses you and all that, and that's the way it is. The people who knew me before, they are totally amazed. Even after 20 years of watching me walk with the Lord, they still can't believe it, that that God would... Forgive me. Why? Because they knew who I was and what I was. That God would use me? That just goes beyond comprehension of an unbeliever. Forgiven, maybe, but used by God? Why? Because that's his very purpose and drawing us in. It's relational. He becomes our Heavenly Father, nurtures, blesses, teaches, protects, provides for. And then he says, I got so much I want you to experience. And so much of that happens as we give ourselves away. So our gifts are given and we're all gifted. Our ministry is, is given and we all have a ministry to bless others. And in the midst of that, to, to glorify God. Now, as John begins to share these things, you need to know as well that, that 
God is never impressed with the kinds of things that impress us. In fact, you know, he says, those things highly esteemed of man or among men, an abomination in the sight of God. That's a challenging verse for a guy like me, and it probably will be for you too if you really understand what he's saying. He's saying, make a list of those things that most impress you about people or life or whatever. And he says, it's an abomination to him. How can that be? Because it so misleads us. If, if we're all about, and I'll tell you what happens when pastors get together. We're like, well, I heard the Lord's really starting to move over there. And by the way, in our community right now, God is pouring out his spirit. When we get together, we're like, man, I've heard great things are going over there at Fred Weimer's uh, church, the, the Foursquare church. They're doing a U-turn for Christ on Friday night and all sorts of teens are coming and starting to give their lives to the Lord. And, and Larry's got his thing going on at Neighborhood and, and Gaylord's got his thing at PV. And, and we get together and, and like, man, God really is moving in our community and in in our churches but inevitably it comes up well how many people have been saved over there lately you know and, and it's like if nobody's gotten saved you're kind of like oh, well you know it's like but we're, we're we're going deeper we're not worried about going broad man we're going deep and you figure out things to say you know but if a bunch of people got saved like well we, we baptized 30 last month and 50 just a month before and we're expecting a real explosion around these movies see and and that's what happens and, and, and what happens is all that is carnality, all that is immaturity, all that is trying to say, I'm really doing a good job over there. And God's saying, it's amazing. This is what I'm thinking. It's amazing. God can even use us because we're so prone to those kinds of attitudes, to, to that kind of thing. But here's what God isn't impressed with. He's not impressed with numbers or how many raise their hand or how many get baptized. Why? It was all him if it's real. And if it's not real, well, for sure he's not impressed with it. If something's really happening in your life and, and you're, you're just excited about Jesus and sharing the Lord and people are seeing that, the natural tendency will be to be puffed up. And we need to so guard ourselves against that. John knew how to do it. He understood when they came and said, man, you're losing the crowds. What's up? He goes, hey. A man can receive nothing unless it's given him from heaven. This ministry that I've had, God gave it to me. And now it's time for the crowds to move to Jesus. And that's what it's all about. Anyone who has disciples unto themselves is missing the point. We're to make disciples for Jesus and of Jesus. And, and we're to be representing him and pointing people to him. By the way, he's the answer when people say, why would you go to church twice in a week? If you say, well, you know, it's, they think it's some kind of legalistic thing, you know. Or if they find out you serve, what, you go to two services? Well, yeah, I serve at one and go to the other. Well, why? Who's making you do that? You know, or, or what do you expect to get out of that? They don't get that it's a response, that you just want to serve the Lord, that you're just overflowing with what he's doing. But here's where you've got to be careful. You need to make sure that they know it's Jesus. The reason we come to church is to worship Jesus, to study about him so we even know why and more to, uh, of why we're worshiping him. So we can worship in spirit and in truth. So, so he's the answer. See, it's relational. It's not, well, you know, you know, my life was messed up and I went down there and I made a commitment. And now I'm, you know, haven't been haven't been drunk for two weeks, you know, and say, like, well, good, you know, but that that isn't all it's about. It's about Jesus as we, we sing in so many of those songs today. Well, John says, look, a man can receive nothing unless it's given him from heaven. You bore me witness. I am not the Christ. Now, he tells us four things about himself and four things about Jesus as he does. And I want you to see these because they're wonderful. As Jesus' forerunner, he says, I must testify that I am not the Christ. I'll tell you something, that word means savior. And there are a lot of people, even believers, well-meaning, they love the Lord and they love people who get confused and think, I got to save them. If I don't save them, what's going to happen to them? I, I got to do it. Listen, there's only one savior and that's Jesus. There's only one Messiah and you're not him. Hey, there's only one Christ and you're not him. Now this takes a huge weight off me personally. I don't feel responsible to save anybody who's lost here today. I remember when my dad got saved, it bugged me so much. Not that he was saved, I was happy about that. 
But I was saved first, and he got saved by a televangelist on TV. And he used to say that. Oh, I got saved by Paul and Jan. And I'm like, no, no, Jesus saved you. Paul and Jan, they're like me, Dad. And, hey, here's two years talking about 20. Watch your mouth, boy. You know, he is that kind of guy. <laughs> I'm like, no, but no, nobody. T- only Jesus saves. People don't save. But it's, again, our natural tendency. Well, I got saved at Calvary. I got saved at Neighborhood. Neighborhood's better than Calvary, but I just go to Calvary because I like this. But, you know, that stuff's all carnal. It's all silly. And so here, here's the point again, is that it's him. And John knew it. And so he said, I am not the Christ. He understood as Jesus' forerunner. He must testify, I'm not the Christ, but he is the Christ. And we're going to come to Jesus, but I want you to see. He also says he was Jesus' friend. And he says the friend of the bridegroom, that would be the best man in in our culture. He must rejoice. When everybody's going to the bridegroom and and, uh, the attention is no longer over the guy that walked up with them or made the toast or something, the, the, the best man doesn't like jump in front and say, but wait, what about me? What about me? I've been at a lot of weddings. I've seen a lot of things. I've never seen that. The attention, when I stand up with a groom, the attention's usually on us. Why? Everybody's facing us and we're standing there. But I'll tell you, as soon as the bride appears, nobody is looking at anybody but her. All eyes fixed on the bride. That's going to be important to us in a moment as we consider one of the most wonderful pictures in Scripture of our relationship to Jesus. But but I'm getting ahead of myself. He says, hey, as the friend, I must rejoice. So if... If the bridegroom and the bride are getting connected, well, awesome. That's, that's why we're here. That's why we rejoice. And then he needed to fade. He understood that. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, decreasing, well, that doesn't come natural to me and it won't come natural to you. It implies a few things, one of them being... We need to become more like him. And the more we are like him, the less people see of us. You know, what we used to be like or what we're like when we're not walking in the spirit or or yielded to the Lord or rightly representing him. I'll give you a good example. As a baby Christian, maybe, oh, three, four months old in the Lord, some friends came and they said, you know, Christians aren't supposed to smoke pot. I don't know why they were telling me that. But I, maybe it was just informational. No, honestly, I, I, I was one of those dumb Christians that thought, well, you know, just, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says a Christian can't smoke pot. And they go, well, go ask your pastor. And I did. I stood in the line and Pastor Chuck, you know, went one person after another after another. And I got to, the, to him and I said, hi, I'm Sam. And, you know, I'm a pot smoking Christian and just wanted to find out if there's anything in the Bible that says I shouldn't be. You see, I didn't even have enough sense to know it was wrong and I should be ashamed or hiding it. But, but there's sort of something wonderful about that. You need to know this as you look around and you see people and you maybe notice they're doing something unbiblical or inappropriate or you find out that couple you just met are living together. You need to know that if you're drawing in people that don't know the Lord or just came to the Lord, which we're always hoping and praying and trying to do, People are going to come in who are caught up in various types of sin. And what's our responsibility? To lovingly and, and humbly open the word and say, look, this isn't a good situation. God has so much better for you guys. Let me show you what the word of God has to say about drinking or, or drugs or, or immorality or whatever it might be, see. But the point is, in a very matter-of-fact way, my pastor, Chuck Smith, just said, hey, it's going to hinder you. It comes from pharmacia, sorcery. You don't want anything to do with it. You want to get away from it as fast as you can. Put it in your past. He didn't say, hey, keep an eye on this guy, you know. That, that's because the, the, there were thousands of hippies getting saved at Calvary Costa Mesa in the time I gave my life to the Lord. It was just common. And so my point is this, in order for people to see Jesus in me, some things had to go. And in the first month, two months, three months, six months, most of the big things that you're dealing with it, those of you who are young Christians, you just know, nobody has to tell you, you're like, yeah, I know, I got to stop that. Uh, There's no way I should be talking like that as a Christian. I mean, you know, there's no way I should be expressing those attitudes or, or still watching those kinds of flicks. You know and so those things have to go. Why? They hinder your growth. And they, they keep you from 
rightly representing the Lord. If he's going to increase, you have got to decrease. And anything that you're about that doesn't look like, act like, think like, talk like him, it really has no place and needs to go. But, but he does that so gently and so lovingly, so patiently. It's like a father who sees his children developing bad habits. You hear him calling somebody an idiot, and you're like, where'd you hear that word? Well, hear you saying it, Dad. And Well, don't say it anymore. You know, you've said it. Don't do what I say. I mean, no, don't do what I do. Do what I say. But what do they do? They do what we do. Well, in any case, things Many things have to change and many things have to go. And now John, he was kind of a unique guy because if you looked at him, you would have thought, man, this guy is very spiritual. But he says, as Jesus' forerunner, I must testify as his friend. I must rejoice as his as one who's fading. I must decrease. The focus has got to be on him. And then as one who's fleshly, he says, hey, I'm of the earth. Carnal, fleshly, earthly, he says, he, he says I, but he, in contrast, is, is from heaven. And, and so John says, I, I understand, I'm just a man. Used by God, yes, transformed by God, absolutely, but, but still just one of, one of many and, and one of the guys. And, and so as spiritual as John appeared to people, he knew he was still of the earth. He was no Messiah. He was no Savior. He was just somebody saying, there he is. And and this is what he's all about. Now, in contrast to that, Jesus is revealed to us in four ways. If John's not the Christ, he reveals Jesus as the Christ. And and know this. This whole thing, this father-child relationship comes about because Jesus did die for our sins. He was buried. He did raise again the third day. He is the Christ, the Savior, the Anointed One, the Messiah. And so John says, I'm not the Christ, but he is the Christ. And then he says, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom, but he's the bridegroom. And there are three things that I want to share with you related to this area. Having done, man, I just don't even know countless numbers of weddings. I think between Bud and I, we have 15 weddings this summer. And, uh, you know, word gets out and more and more young single people start coming because they say, well, that's happening over there. I don't know about the rest, but people are getting hitched. So, you know, (laughs) if you're single, you're probably looking around thinking, could she be the one? Could he be the one? It just happens. It's natural. But but here's the thing. He says Jesus is the bridegroom. And he's been called a lot of things up to this point. But you need to see this picture because it's so good. Listen, what is a bridegroom all about? He's just all about his bride. I've been there as I shared. I've stood with so many grooms. And I've watched that bride come down. And I've watched big tough guys, you know. that Man, they could take ten on, ten on and nobody going to push them around. They'd never cry at a movie no matter what. Uh, but, but they see their bride coming. They see that beautiful gal clothed in white walking down the altar. And tears come to their eyes. There is something so precious and wonderful and tender about that relationship. And in that moment in history, we celebrate it. We get our family and friends together. We want them to hear the vows. We want them to see our bride. And I want to tell you, that's why he picks this image. That's why he chooses this image. It's a title for Jesus in Scripture. The Bible says he is the bridegroom and we, the church, we're the bride of Christ. His love, his desire is just to be with, share with, bless on his bride. His joy, just seeing her clothed in white. And you know, the Bible says that when we see Jesus we are going to be clothed in his righteousness. Do you know what we're going to be at? A wedding. Because it's marriage supper of the Lamb and immediately after a beautiful and wonderful feast. Now this deals with a very important third area. And that is some of you have heard no doubt and and I've heard people say this stuff that, that when we get to heaven... God's going to put a big screen up like this and it's not going to have a beautiful picture of of the ocean or something, you know, that beautiful cove. No, he's going to get you up there and he's going to put all your sins up there and you're going to have to account for them. Listen, that wouldn't be heaven to me. And, uh, And it wouldn't be heaven to you. 
And if he says it's a wedding, now I've been to a lot of weddings. I shared that with you. And one of the things that a lot of people are doing today is taking advantage of technology. I'm not saying there won't be a movie there. I don't know that. He may very well do it. But, but here's what I think we're going to see if we see anything. Recently, I saw one of the most wonderful weddings where, where they showed a, a video collage of, of a bunch of slides and pictures of, of the bride and the groom growing up. Have you been to a wedding where they did that thing? And, the, and they show the bride and she's like, you know, just a little cute little baby. And then they show the groom and, and same deal. And then, then you see them around the Christmas tree and they got their, their little feety jam and stuff, you know, and, and everybody's, oh, they're so, look how cute she was. And, and then they just continue to grow. You see them in the first day of school, and then you see them in their graduation caps and gowns. And, and then you see them, if their parents were fortunate enough to get the picture, first date, you know, and, and, then, and then here they are getting married. Listen, if there's going to be anything shown about my life on a screen at that wedding feast, God's going to be showing all the things, that, oh, look, and, and here's Sam when he was just a baby. What's isn't he cute? Look at that. And, and that's how God is toward us. And none of us would, we're not going to say, and, and here's a picture of when you were arrested for, you know, you stole that car at 14. You know, here you are in the handcuffs being led away. <laughs> and here she is, got a lot of pimples and stuff. Remember that? Wasn't that fun, honey? You know? No, we don't do that. And God's not going to do that either. He wants us to understand not only is it about a relationship, but it's about a loving relationship. And someone who loves you doesn't expose your sin. He covers your sin. Love covers a multitude of sins. In my case, that's absolutely necessary. Probably in yours as well. Love covers because the blood of Jesus washes us of all sin. The, the word of God, now you are clean through the word I've spoken to you. Cleansed judicially by his blood, practically through the word. Listen, it, it just can't get any better than that. He is the Christ. He is the bridegroom. He must increase so more of him and less of me. You, you know what sometimes happens? I, I know it's happened to some of you. You realize all this is true. You're chosen of the Lord and loved by the Lord. And now you've got a ministry and you're gifted and God starts to use your life. And do you remember that movie, What About Bob? Some of you have seen it. Do you remember when they strapped him to the front of the boat and he's like, I'm sailing, I'm sailing, I'm a sailor. That's not exactly how the average person sails. But, but that's kind of what we're like, I think, to God. He probably gets a chuckle. We're like, well, I'm serving, I'm serving. And he's like, well, that is an amazing thing. B but in any case, it was the very purpose for which we were created, to know him and, and love him and, and represent him and serve him and serve others. And, and so if we're serving, we're like, I'm serving, I'm serving. We're just like that. What about Bob? The, the emphasis should be on him. Isn't it amazing? That, that I'm, I'm serving the Lord? Isn't it amazing that I'm forgiven by the Lord? Isn't it amazing that he wants to use my life? That he cares about me personally and intimately? He must increase and I must decrease. The fourth thing he tells us about Jesus there. He who comes from above is above all. Verse 31. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes down from heaven is above all. Jesus came down from heaven. When we get to chapter 6, and of course you can read ahead, seven times he says, I not only came down from heaven, but he tells us why, what he came to do. But it brings us to our conclusion for our time this morning. And verses 32 and 33, he predicts once again Jesus' rejection. He says, what he has seen and heard, he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Now, he's not saying no one at all, but he's saying even among those who appear to be saying, yeah, that's good, I'll go, I'm, I'm into it, I, where do I sign up? Many would fall away, many would drift away, many would be caught up in other things. And so he's saying, listen... He would be rejected. He came into his own, but his own received him not. John 1, 11. And then John 3, 11. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we've seen. And you do not receive our witness, the words of our Lord and Savior. So, so many hear and, and reject the message. Verses 34 and 5. 
emphasize once again, he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Jesus brings us not only the words of life, he is the life. He isn't just a way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he had the Spirit without measure and bestows it upon us as, as much as we're open to it without measure. And then finally, in verse 36, there's a conclusion and a separation and a time for decision. He who believes in the Son, and I want you to, if you're a Bible marker, surround or surround circle, underline whatever highlight that word has. He who believes, and that word means to trust in, to cling to, to rely upon, to put your full weight upon. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. That means if, if you've trusted in him, you didn't used to believe, but now you do believe. You, you didn't used to serve him, but now you do serve him. You didn't used to love him, but now you do love him. He's saying you have eternal life. You've received the free gift. And, and then he says, in contrast to that, he who does not believe, the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now listen, God doesn't want one person here to perish. But he makes it clear. If you have the son, you're his. If you don't have the son, you're not his. But you can change that even now. You can turn it around. How? He who believes in Jesus, trust in him. Forget about the law, man. You can't keep it. You're not going by the deeds of the law. No flesh will be justified. It's not about memberships and ceremonies and sacrifices. It's all about Jesus. And so today he offers you, as he's offered to every person here, the free gift of everlasting life. The question is, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Do you believe he died for your sins and was buried and rose again? And if you believe it, have you received him? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Have you been born again of the Spirit of God? Do you know the Father as your heavenly Father? D do you see Jesus as one who loves you so much he died for you and waits for you and will be with you in eternity? Listen, this is the moment of decision. A and if you've never given your life to the Lord, you are going to make a decision right now. You're either going to say, Lord, I do believe and I want to receive you. I open my heart to you. Be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. I yield my life to you. Or you're going to say no. You, you might be saying, well, maybe later. Or I'm not sure he'd accept me. He will. He says, all who come to me, I I'll receive. As many as received him to these he gave power. Well, I don't know if I'll be able to walk the walk. I mean, I've watched Christians struggle and stumble. He who begins the good work will be faithful to complete it. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too bad of a sinner. I don't see how you could be and, and even make it in this room. If God's tugging at your heart, this is the moment. This is the day. This is the hour of salvation. Let's pray. Lord, my heart joins with that of those of every believer here and we cry out to you for those you've drawn in who are not yet born again who've not yet experienced that absolute cleansing of sin lord john was there baptizing in the the waters the pools of peace oh lord you've promised a peace peace with you and, and peace from you that we could survive the trials and temptations and problems of this world. Lord, I pray for any and all here who've never given their lives to you that they will even now. And while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. And if you'll do that, I'll pray for you. God bless you. I see your hand back there. Others here, God bless you up here. I see your hand as well. You guys can put your hands down after I acknowledge you. Others want to join these two and say, Lord, come into my life. Wash me clean. I know your blood can cleanse of sin. Cleanse me of my sin. I know your word can purify my heart and mind. Purify my heart and mind. If you've never given your life to him, join these two today. 
open your heart to Jesus. Anyone else this hour, this service, this moment, ready to say yes? Anybody else? Lord, for these, we rejoice and we know that you're at work in hearts that that have yet to yield, that are still struggling, just not sure. Lord, don't let them go. Continue to pursue them and and to woo them. Show them how much you love them and, and how much they need you. But for these two, In any others, Lord, in the the sound of my voice that are saying, yes, Lord, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my sin. I believe in you. I receive you. Lord, we rejoice. And you who've raised your hand and any others who want to pray along, just pray these words aloud after me. Heavenly Father, I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to die for my sins to die in my place. I know I'm a sinner and I ask your forgiveness and I receive the cleansing made possible by Jesus' shed blood. Show me your plan for my life. Seal me with your Holy Spirit. Transform me and use me to bless others and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome these into the family.